got, I got, I got, I got loyalty, got royalty inside my DNA. Uh, even though it's very early in the three, we have a lot to talk about. So I, <laughs> I propose we just start. Yeah. All right. Cool. Whoa, we're, we're getting raided with a party of 50. How did someone have exactly 50 friends? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem real. Um, no. Anyway, so I'm, yeah, so everyone welcome to PL Talk. This is a now weekly live stream that Hongi has gotten trapped in. <laughs> um, I am Jean, uh, I am Jean, Jean Kasor, and oh my gosh, it really was 50, exactly 50 friends plus three. <laughs> and um, uh, I am uh, the trapper of Hongi. We um, do this live stream every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific. The goal is to bring programming languages, knowledge to the world. Um, and um, for background, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Akita Software. Um, our website is getting better every day. You should check it out. Um, and I previously was a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon, which ties into our special guest today. And then, um, but wait, first, Hongi, you should introduce yourself, and then I can, I can finish my segue into introducing the guests. Sure. Hey, I'm Hongi. Uh, I am an engineer at Figma. We're big users of TypeScript as well as other interesting technologies like WebAssembly, et cetera. Um, I represent the non-academic uh, viewpoint, the, the every man, as it were, the every person. Yeah, the every programmer. Um, yeah, so when I was a professor, even before I officially started my job at Carnegie Mellon University, I, um, I, my professor friend, Jan Hoffman, was telling me he had this amazing undergrad. He's like, there's this amazing undergrad, you have to meet him. We're doing all this really, really fancy type stuff together. We were just like up all night writing a paper. And um, he had like all these stories um, and he didn't really have that many other students. So it just sounded like he and this undergrad were just like, you know, skipping around the campus of Carnegie Mellon all the time talking about types. And so I started at CMU and then I got to meet Ben who is this undergrad. And so um, the reason I'm telling this story is to, to kind of give you the background of the very like strong static type CMU altar of Bob Harper standard ML background where Ben was formed into the Ben he is today. And now here he is working on the TypeScript compiler. So I think this is a, a very interesting uh, evolution of his career, but I think it's, it's a good one because I think that, you know, for everyone who is skeptical about adding types to uh, JavaScript, here's a person who, you know, was doing very principled stuff and now he has decided to devote his life to this. So, um, and then Ben brought along his colleague, Daniel. And so we have um, a much awaited, much requested uh, stream today about TypeScript. So um, yeah, we were hoping you, you two could just introduce yourselves a little bit and then we'll just get into some, some demos. I, yeah. I have no idea that Ben was such a such a nerd. No, I'm just kidding. Right? Yeah. No, you know exactly how much of a nerd I am. <laughs> we knew. No, we knew. It's fine. But that's why we that's why we get along. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Gene. Um, yeah, like Gene said, I'm Ben. I've been at Microsoft for about four years after graduating Carnegie Mellon, um, and I work on the TypeScript tooling side of the house. Um, so uh, our team has about oh. Uh, I think there's about seven to 10 people on my side. Daniel, how many are on the compiler side? Probably yeah, also seven same, to 10. I think it's yeah. like um, And so, um, and we work on everything from uh, the compiler itself to the core language service, to editor support, to engineering systems and, and all just to build out the best TypeScript uh, system we can. Uh, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, hey, I'm Daniel uh, Rosenwasser. Um, I am a program, I'm the, language program manager on the team. Um, and uh, so I, I started on the team about seven years ago um, this month. So that's kind of cool. Wow. Uh, and I originally, yeah, right. Uh, as an engineer on the team, um, you know, also was really, really into PL theory before I, I joined. Um, we really wanted to join uh, Microsoft for our, our tooling division because, you know, we, we were very involved in the languages space. Um, not really knowing, like knowing about TypeScript at the time, but like not really thinking it was a thing I would land on at all. Um, but uh, ended up being an engineer. And then uh, I got really, really excited about working with our community, which is uh, how I ended up making a transition to the PM role and trying to like help people adopt TypeScript and understanding like what sorts of things that we could do within the language to, to sort of grow it out. Um, so that, that, that's me and that's how I ended up here. 
That's awesome. And we get a lot of questions um, at various points from our community about, you know, how do I get an industry job working on type checkers? How do I get a, the where is even hiring for this stuff? So um, if, if you want to hang out in the Discord after, I, I'm sure there exist people who have some questions for you about that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And before we jump into demos, there are a few questions that people have been asking us on the internet this week that um, uh, Hongi and I thought we could start by covering. And so um, I think there was, there was one very recent one that I thought was good, which is, you know, what is Microsoft's interest in investing all this money in TypeScript? You know, like, it would, what's the history of TypeScript of Microsoft? What's, you know, what's the investment like? And then just for everyone who um, maybe started with JavaScript and didn't really experience types in another language, what's the motivation? And, you know, what, what is the full vision of, of bringing types to, to JavaScript? So that's, that's a really good question. And that kind of like, I mean, it's actually a very direct answer. If, if you if you look back at the history of like how this all sort of happened, um, it, 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 it comes from early days where Microsoft was realizing we need to have more of a web presence in the sorts of applications that we build out, right? So for example, um, Office, right? Like Office is the thing that people, you know, are, that's one of the things that people get introduced to very early on with Microsoft stuff. And like the easiest example of like why you need to have a web presence is like very easy, Google Docs, stuff like that, yeah. right? Um, so like you see Google Docs and you're like, oh, wow, that's really easy to get started with. We need to have like the same sort of web presence. And so early days of that were, um, were, you know, how do we build something as sophisticated as Office for the web, right? That's really difficult. That's amb ambitious. And if you actually look at what, you know, I think, was it Gmail that, that started, you know, was one of the early adopters of their stuff. They were compiling Java to JavaScript. Um, and like- Oh, Michael, I have used yes. that compiler. <laughs> yeah, wit, right? GWT? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so uh, so that that you know, I think that I think that's the name of it, right? Um, and so you know, we, there was a very similar technology that Office had developed, I think, called Script Sharp. Um, and the idea is you take C sharp code and you compile it down to JavaScript. And there was a question of like, well, you know, do you do you is this something that we want to you know build out more broadly? Um, and you know, some of the PL people who are really involved with C sharp are like, hey, that's really cool, but at the same time, that's that's really fundamentally not the way you should be building software for this platform, right? This is it, you're always going to have these sort of like impotence mismatches of like, here's how you do it in JavaScript, here's how you do it in like C sharp, and like there's some sort of like weirdness you have to account for in in, in strange ways, um, and and so like you know, you have to understand like why were people so intent on using C sharp or Java to like build their software that yeah. they were not willing to use JavaScript. And that comes down to like two things really, a point in time problem and the lack of types. And so that point in time problem is really more about where JavaScript was as, as, a, as a, in, you know, as a language at that time, which was like around 2008 or so. And at this time, <laughs> Um, uh, a, a standardization effort had failed a couple of years prior to like um, to add a bunch of things to JavaScript, including types. Uh, that was called ECMAScript 4. Actually, if you're interested in the history, there's a big long one from Alan Wurfsbrock about that. Um, that was published to um, an ACM conference, I think, recently. But uh, so, so ECMAScript four not working out. ECMAScript five had been standardized. Added a bunch of added a bunch of really nice things, but still lacked a lot of stuff to structure your program easily, like modules and classes and things like that. So, like if you want to mod modularize your code, you have to like use either some special build system, organize your syntax in a really weird way, or like just use a bunch of hacks that you kind of keep track of mentally uh, to do classes you either pick a class meta library to like create classes for you, or you have to like uh, remember how to set up prototypes, which like nobody does. No one, no one remembers how to do that. I don't remember how to do that. Most people on the team probably don't remember how to do that, but classes like could set those things up. So, so these things got added to a language version called ECMAScript 6. Um, but the thing that they still were lacking was static type checking. And static types are the things that help you um, 
in most languages, catch errors, uh, ensure that you're, you're, you're limiting certain classes of, of bugs. Um, and, and also they can light up your tooling. They can, they can power your tooling, which is a very underrated and, and you know, not often enough discussed point. Um, and what I mean by tooling is like, you know, most, mostly editors, right? Like editing, autocomplete, go to definition, finding all uses of a variable, stuff that like Ben's side of the house works on a lot of, right? And so that like includes for Microsoft Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Um, so, so engineers at Microsoft really wanted that. And we realized that there was an appetite for that beyond just Microsoft, right? Um, and we knew that you could not create a language to satisfy that if it was not open source and created with like the principles of the JavaScript community. And so that's, that's, that's where TypeScript started, right? With those principles and the idea of adding static types and adding modern features to JavaScript at the time, which like lacked all those things. Yeah, and I think this is an awesome overview of why did TypeScript succeed, where CoffeeScript, ECMAScript, <laughs> GWT, every other effort has failed. And that's something that hopefully will um, come out over the course of this conversation more as well. Yep. Um, Wait, I had one quick question um, as well, was, which is quite related, which is, um, why do you think it took so long to get here? Because I think JavaScript basically came around in like the late 90s, right? And um, TypeScript was like early 2010s. Yeah, I think 20, something 20, like that. Public release of the, okay. the pre-release. Okay, yeah. So I guess it didn't, had been in, in progress before then. So that's basically like 12 years or so. Um, was it just like there were all these efforts to try to maybe build in types into the core JavaScript language, and then those efforts had failed, or was there other stuff at play? Uh -huh. Do you think? So ECMAScript 4 was that effort to try to bring types into the language, right? You had ECMAScript 3, which was, you know, uh, that's like the, the basics of what you have in like 1999 forward, right? And then um, there's like, okay, now we're going to do everything. And so you have like putting, you're trying to put in every feature and, um, and then you start trying to implement these things not really knowing how they're going to work out. And that's like, this is like the big bang approach a lot of software was taking back in the 90s or like early 2000s as well, right? The big bang of like, create all the features, bring them together, they all explode. Now like you're delayed three years, right? And that just, it, it's very hard to do that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, you see efforts like ECMAScript 4 and you're like, okay, well, we'll add types. What does a type mean? And so first off, between many, many different committee members, that's hard to define because everyone has a different viewpoint, right? The other thing is, okay, let's say, say you try to take one of them. The one that I think that they took was like runtime types. Yeah. And that's, that's slow, right? When yeah. you're running with JavaScript, like there were many efforts to do things like sound script and say, uh, I think it was called sane script and that was renamed or something like that. Um, but there were there were ideas of what if you you tighten the language a little bit and you try to have a, a safe, well typed language with you know all the substitutability constraints that you would expect in most languages. Um, but when you need to enforce that at runtime, that's like overhead every single time, right? And and so you have to still check it, and you you maybe can optimize it ahead of time, um, but which is like what sometimes Clojure does. But it, it, it you know. You'd think types would make you always faster, but types are not always just about speed, despite what a lot of people thought TypeScript was about initially. Like, oh, can you know that's another topic we can talk about a little bit here too. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's very hard to define that, right? Yeah, that makes sense. So um yeah, so I think a lot of people wonder, you know, like what is what is TypeScript about? Um, do you have some examples of, you know, this is JavaScript that <laughs> works very poorly if you don't type check it, or um, this is, you know, this is why you want TypeScript uh, concretely? Sure. Um, let me let me share um, let me share my screen. Um, can you see? Can you see my editor? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna just delete some stuff so you can see like I'm actually doing real work and I'm not just like doing smoke and mirror. Hide the um, evidence. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't practicing this before. No, uh, I mean, okay, so 
Um, so here's some basic JavaScript code. Um, and what I, what I want to show you is like what it, what TypeScript is all about. What does TypeScript add to this, right? Um, and so, you know, if you, if you all, by the way, like if there's something that you need to call out, just call it out as I demo. Um, and you should all use PowerShell 7 according to my prompt. Uh, okay, so, so what I have here is um, a JS file and I have a, a, what's called a TS config, which is just, you know, a configuration file for TypeScript. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a really simple thing, which is I'm gonna rename this to a .ts file. And so I've now switched this over to TypeScript. I'm also using the strictest settings that I can, right? So TypeScript by default tries to make you um, pretty lax so that you can migrate your JavaScript. So in a situation like this, it would be, it would be you know, a little easier, but I'm, I'm gonna intentionally turn on the strictest settings that I can. I'm gonna explain uh, how this all works. I'm also gonna turn the compiler on um, with watch mode. So we have a thing called the TypeScript compiler, TSC. I'm gonna point it at the source folder. I'm gonna put it in watch mode. And I'm trying to move the, what? Basic oh, basic. Slash is it basic? Oh, source. man. <laughs> yeah, there, okay. yeah, there you go. Eventually I can, I can type stuff. All right, so it's in watch mode. Um, and it'll tell me it's getting some errors, but at the same time, it's also gonna give me a JavaScript file. And the, the, the way that you should sort of think about this is like by default, we're always trying to make it easy to migrate to TypeScript. And the whole idea of red squiggles is, you know, errors in your editor, right? You find out about these things as you type. Um, and we, it's kind of like in, in Word when you're typing, like we're not gonna stop you from printing your document. We're not gonna stop you from compiling your document, right? Um, so I'm gonna look at the first error message and it's saying that this thing implicitly has a type called any. So the any type is basically the, the most lax thing that you can work with in TypeScript. It's the most permissive type. It lets you, um, you know, you can call something with called, you know, that with type any, I can construct it. I can get anything off of it. Um, and, and basically it, it, it is the most lax thing. And this is the behavior you get by default if you're in JavaScript, right? And everything is any, but I'm using the strictest settings. And what it wants me to do is actually tell me the type of, of this variable of this parameter called first name, um, because it, it's not gonna figure that out on its own. So I'm gonna say that this has the type string. And so what I've done here is I've added something called a type annotation. Right, I'm actually saying that this thing is a string, right? Um, and 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 basically, what this gives me is some information to tell me whether or not I'm going to call greet correctly and whether or not I'm going to use first name correctly, right? And that's that's the idea. That's one of the core ideas of types is it tells you about the capabilities of the values that are going to flow into your variables to tell you if you're going to do something wrong. And so if I hover over this this two uppercase thing. Uh, it'll tell me two uppercase does not exist on type string. Did you mean this other thing, right? And so what I've accidentally done or intentionally done for the demo is um, misspell two uppercase, right? So uh, it usually is spelled with a C and based, based on the types themselves, um, I, can, I, I can use my tooling to get a quick fix and, and autocorrect that, right? Um, and the way that TypeScript knows about this is if I go to definition on this thing, it'll take me to the thing called a DTS file. So this DTS file is kind of like a header file if you're familiar with C. And the core thing there is, um, even though this code wasn't written with TypeScript, I can define this for any TypeScript user so that I can compile cleanly and I know what I'm able to call and construct and access on different variables too. So this thing exists in the string type. Um, so that's an easy one, right? I've annotated something with string. Um, I'll do the same thing here with parse headers. So I'm gonna get a bunch of lines from an HTTP request. And they typically are just like lines separate, you know, lines of headers. And each of those headers is, you know, separated by a colon space, right? Um, and so what I'm gonna try to do here is, you know, split each of the lines and then split each of the, of the headers themselves. And then um, I'm gonna try to add them to a map in some way, right? So I'm, I'm in, let's say I'm in the middle of coding this. Well, 
here it's saying that this split property doesn't exist on a string array. And what I might have done if I was in JavaScript is written this and then run this thing and it would have said um, cannot call, you know, undefined is not a function, right? Because I would try to access a variable called split and then call that and then it would just crash. Um, what I instead have to do is I have to map on each of those things on each of the lines and I can now say line turn line that split. I guess I didn't have to exactly do that. Um, and then I had to actually call trim. Um, and then if I go here, I realize, oh, well, first of all, I'm not using header, but also I'm accessing the wrong thing. So what I probably meant to do was as I went through each of these, I meant to access the header for each of these. So it's, it's, it's more like once you have types, right? Like notice that as I added some information, I had another mistake that was unveiled and another mistake that was unveiled. And these are things that as you write your code, you have to run them incrementally to figure out if you've done the wrong thing. With a type, you can figure out by saving, recompiling, saving, recompiling, saving, and recompiling. Or as you type, if you have the right editor, you can actually just see it as you type, right? And you can see if you've done the wrong thing and you're asked to second guess the minute that you've typed that character. So, so those are some of the fundamentals of types. Um, and, and, and the whole idea of TypeScript is we, we erase all of those. So if I jump back to the output here, notice that apart from the new lines, we don't have anything. This is the same code that I wrote, right? Um, so I have headers, I have first name, they don't have any annotations. Um, so I don't know if we have any questions or things I should, I should jump. Yeah. I just wanted to jump in on a couple of things. So, um, like I, I'm really passionate about how much focus we put on, on helping people migrate from JavaScript to TypeScript. And I, and I really don't want to understate like how cool it is, or at least I think cool it is the idea of moving from the any type, um, to an annotated string type. Um, like this is this notion of gradual typing. Like I make this joke to people, which is not totally a joke, that um, TypeScript is a uh, static analysis tool that pretends it's a language. And here it's like a static analysis tool that lets you apply gradual typing principles um, to really just take uh, dynamically typed, just like chaos, right? In here, it's, it's little cute little agents of chaos, which are your argument arguments and really bring them into a safer world that's statically typed and see that spread throughout the rest of your program and potentially catch errors with it. And so this idea of taking this dynamically typed JavaScript code base and slowly, slowly applying types to it to bring it into order is something that uh, I think we put a lot of care into um, and making that process as um, ergonomic for new users as possible. I love so the agents of chaos. You're like the Bob yeah. Ross of, <laughs> right. of yeah. I I love this. And um Ben, could you talk just a little bit um for people who don't understand what gradual typing is, what you know, a little bit about the challenges of combining statically type type checkable code with not st statically type check checkable right. code and why this isn't just obvious. Yeah, um, so I mean yeah. definitely I I, I I want to take a step back, first of all, and I'm using these terms static types and dynamic types. And, and I want to just, because uh, there's a lot of discourse on the internet about like, what's the right way to do stuff. And so um, here, here's, here's what I would say. Um, so like dynamic types, dynamically typed systems are like JavaScript or like Python. Um, and notably in both of these cases, they're interpreted languages where you don't have a compile step. We, you don't have a step up front where it could possibly warn you about things and stuff will fail at runtime. And so um, the way this is expressed sort of in the purest form of the language is everything effectively has the same type. Here we call it any, you know, you don't really know what it is. It's some value and it could be callable. It could have properties. We don't know. What the static types give you are a description of what the thing it is, like Daniel said earlier, like what capabilities does it have? What, what can I do with this value? Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, like th there's this pretty big gap there almost, like 
uh, you have some value in memory that you don't know what it does, it could do anything, versus something you have a clear specification for. And what we call gradual typing are systems that sort of unite the two and allow you to do some sort of reasoning over that gap, where you can say, like we're doing here, we're taking some any value and we're saying, all right, here we're going to assert that it has um, these capabilities, like when he puts string there. Um, and, and that gives us a sense of what it is, what it could do, and, and what could go wrong if we used it wrong. Um, right, like just yeah. like when I, as soon as, you know, if I remove the annotation, right, mm -hmm. you know, our tooling is not able to do anything with this, right? It's useless now. Right. Uh, as soon as I decide to add that, that dot, that colon string here, I get all my methods and so like you know your your static analysis tool but also your 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 authoring tooling is able to assist you in those ways and so typically you know you have these sort of like religious wars of like dynamic typing static typing and there's a little bit of in between and within that in between you can kind of like edge towards you know this idea of soundness too if you want to get at that um, there's, there's, you know, stricter settings thing, you know, and, and, and so like, it's not really a, you know, binary thing. It's more of a dial is the way that we've mm -hmm. kind of explained it to people. And, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that Ben said, um, which is, you know, we, we try to assist you as you migrate as well. Like we, we have really tried as in as many ways as we, we can think of, right. Um, different ways that are practical. So for example, here, uh, we, we don't do inference at the type system level that, that you know, looks at use sites, you know, call sites of a function, but we will use that in the tooling to try to figure that out. If you ask us on demand and we'll figure out, oh, you call this with a string, we can try to figure that out from the call sites and then throw that in there. And that goes a long way. Um, there's some other nuances of like, hey, type JavaScript, do you really need to even use a TypeScript file for that? And maybe we can get into that later too, because that's also really cool. Um, but I don't know if we, I don't know if we, if we want to keep diving deeper in on yeah. this. I, and just one other aspect of what you did. So I don't think you meant to do this, but on line 12, originally you had forgotten that parenthesis, right? And it was giving you an error, but also split headers still had the right type. And, and so that's something Oh, well, I guess it doesn't now, but yeah. it did. You have oh, to believe me, moved, go moved. back in time. Like, oh yeah, that's why. Yeah. And so um, there's also a notion here of um, expanding the compiler bit, behind, bit like beyond you did this right, great. You did this wrong, here's your error. Everything else is busted. But sort of this um, self-repairing, I'm missing a better term for it, but like of, of trying to recover and be resilient to user error so that we can continue to be more generally helpful at the tooling level uh, and, and not just fall over if the compiler error is out. And I think that's also really compelling. Yeah, th this, is, this is something that within, within Microsoft, if you're building a compiler for like a real language or like some sort of tooling, you are, you, we typically think of like type checkers or compilers as like yes or no, right? Like you get some errors and the better that you can give more errors without just popping over, that's better because, you know, you don't have to like rerun over and over again to find your next one. Um, so we build our parsers in a tolerant way. We build our type checker in a tolerant way um, so that as you type, you can figure things out and, and you don't just have to like, you know, rerun the compiler to get feedback. Cause that's a, that's a pretty miserable experience is the truth of it. Um, yeah, I love the flexibility that it gives you with the, the gradual typing as well. It makes it so much easier to uh, work with other libraries. Yeah. So I have a question about the gradual typing because um, my understanding is that uh, a lot of gradual type systems aren't able to be implemented efficiently because you need to add runtime checks to handle the cases that you can't fully statically type check. And so I'm like, what, what do you guys actually just straight up statically type check? Uh, how do you do you insert runtime checks? That was not clear to me. Um, and um, if not, how how do you actually handle the the gradual typing then? So we 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 do not insert runtime checks. And our perspective is that um, it, I mean, it kind of was a little bit loosey goosey in the early days of TypeScript. But our perspective nowadays is um, 
totally erasable. That's that's the goal that we strive for. So uh, we don't insert runtime checks. Uh, if you look at the output again, uh, you can see that um, it's it's the same code. Uh, actually, I can put them side by side. Um, it's the same code except for maybe indentation, right? Um, and 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 basically, what we're we're doing is we're assuming that you, the programmer, um, are are not trying to shoot yourself in the foot, right? Like there is a little bit of, you know, unsoundness in a sense, because from the outside world, you could call this function with a number. And you know what, ba basically that's, that is actually a point of contention for some people who, are, who build libraries with TypeScript, because what they're, what they're saying is I'm creating a contract. I'm assuming that you are going to call my functions correctly with strings inst instead of numbers or things that are almost matching these objects. Um, and in those cases, I'll work correctly um, because in a lot of JavaScript, you have to kind of insert your own runtime checks to ensure that no one's gonna pass you an invalid input. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think being totally erasable both doesn't impact the speed of your code um, doesn't impose any strong uh, preferences because you, the programmer, are free to decide if you want to inject those own run, your own runtime checks. Um, and then there's also a point of like, you know, not we we don't even know what your runtime check should be in a lot of these cases because JavaScript is a very duck type system, right? Um, it is it is dynamically typed, and so uh, many objects that that would satisfy certain functions do. And um, enforcing structural checks against these types would be kind of uh, difficult. And I can, I can go into structural typing in, in a bit as well, um, or now if you want to. Um, cool, so this relates to another question, which is um, like, what, uh, what are the guarantees then? <laughs> if you <laughs> erase the types and then other things could happen, um, what are the guarantees? And um, it seems like if the guarantee isn't complete soundness, like what is the philosophy on, 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 on the guarantee? Well, your, your guarantees are already defined in part by the JavaScript runtime. And that's actually really important because oh. um, you're, you're basically at least as safe as that, right? Um, you, you don't get into the same, when, when we talk about like this language is unsound, that often sounds very scary if you're talking about a language like C++ that is just dealing with raw bytes. And if you accidentally trample over some raw bytes over here, then, you know, everything is completely, you know, you, you might actually have like messed with the kernel or something like that if you don't have the right memory protections and things like that. Um, so so those, those are important to, to, that's an important safety guarantee. Um, but you're also able to actually make sure that you're 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 doing the the operations that it's it's hard to explain, but are are clearly right in a sense, right? So you don't have like a formal definition necessarily all of the time, but for example, um, in JavaScript, this is perfectly acceptable code. This has a very well defined behavior. When you type in that property name, you'll get undefined. But the question is whether or not that's useful. And so um, our type system is very interested in finding the set of useful code patterns that people tend to write um, to allow existing JavaScript to be authored, but also catch obvious mistakes. So like that two lowercase um, example was like an, a, an easy one to show off. Um, Basically, knowing what's there, what properties are present, if you're if you're accessing a variable that is known to be defined, um, or or you know multiplying two strings, right? You want you want to know if those are like well, not just well defined operations in JavaScript, but like useful in a sense too. Um, and yeah, those I mean, flags that I mentioned help with that too. Yeah, just to, just to summarize, um, the way I see it is it's internal consistency. It's not external protection. Um, certainly, if you're a library author, like you need to write your implementation so that you know if people pass you garbage, people are passing you garbage, uh, and like you know what to do with that, and you're you're defensive against that. Um, I, I also want to make the point, and this goes back to the gradual typing thing. And sorry if I'm misusing the term gradual typing, if that does imply runtime checks, because we don't have those. Um, but you can use the any type internally, and you can use it intentionally if there's some blob of something that either we can't model successfully or 
Um, you know, it is some unsafe code that you know about. It is an unsafe entry point. Um, like, you can mess that up. And, and, and we're not going to be able to handle that. And so it's, um, it, it, it is not a foolproof system. Um, and your guarantees are not absolute. But, but what you do get is um, internal consistency amongst in a file, in a module, across modules. Um, and we find that compelling from the scalability perspective. Cool. Yeah. Well, so I know um, Ben and Daniel, you mentioned you had some meta programming examples you wanted to show. Sure. Um, I, I want to talk about some of the things that kind of um, you know, make TypeScript a little bit more special than most statically typed languages that people are familiar with. Um, first off, I want to talk a little bit about union types. Um, so in some cases, you might have something, uh, a function that takes either a number or a string. So I showed you a parameter that could be a string. Um, and now I'm going to show you something that can be either a number or a string. So we can have something called padding here. Um, so pad left here is supposed to take, you know, I'll actually put if the padding is on the left. I'll put that on the left. Um, this is the way that you can actually express the type script that you have something that is either a string or a number, right? This is called a union type. Um, the whole idea here is that you can accept multiple inputs. So I can call pad left with, um, you know, an actual string of padding, or I can um, call it with a number and it's fine with that. But it's not going to just take garbage, right? I can't pass in a Boolean instead. It's going to tell me that that's uh, not assignable. Um, and so the way that you would write this is you would need to actually perform your own JavaScript runtime checks to act to actually know how you're going to handle the value. So if I because if I try to say something like um, padding dot and I hit dot, I don't get any of the methods. Uh, except the ones that are common to both the string and the number, because I don't know which one was actually passed in. So what I'll do here is I'll say um, if the padding or if the type of the padding is, and it can tell me which ones I, I am possibly going to cho choose. Um, if the padding is a number, then I get all the methods of a number. And now I can actually say, um, you know, I can create a for loop on this equals zero, i is less than padding, i plus plus, and then I can do whatever I was going to do. I can just like loop and add a space to the beginning of the, of the string. Um, and otherwise, and you know, I can say like return, uh, let's just say return string for now. I know that this is not a complete function, um, but now when I, when I am in the other branch here, I can say padding dot, and I can see that now I have all the methods of a, of a string because what we're able to do here is we're able to not just um, do the checks to see what the type is within each of these branches, which is called narrowing. We actually use the control flow analysis of this function to determine, uh, to, to, to refine, this is often called refinement, uh, but we know how to narrow in the other branches uh, to say, now, okay, if in that branch you were a number and you returned something, then in this branch, um, the number of cases unreachable, it must be a string. And now I can do anything that I need to. Um, and I can just return padding. I can return padding. I can also spell return correctly, padding plus string. Um, and I could do it, I could do all that correctly. Um, so that's union types. Um, and one of the things that we, we can do with union types, um, which is pretty neat. Um, is we can, we can actually use another concept called a literal type too. Um, so let's create a function called align text. I'm not gonna define the specific, um, the specific implementation, but I'll say that you have some text and then you have an alignment, which is typically gonna be either the string, I'm gonna close this. Uh, it's gonna be the string either left, center or right. Um, so you could just define this as string. Um, but one of the things that we've also been able to do in TypeScript is 
you have these stringly typed APIs, not strongly typed, stringly typed, because the whole idea is um, you expect a certain set of strings, right? So what we've actually done is create some, created something called a literal type. So you can say that this thing can only be called with the string left right now. And then you can get auto completion for that, which is pretty neat. Um, but that's not really useful because if you're always going to call it with the same one value, that's kind of dumb. Um, so you probably want to also call it with a couple of other strings too. And so now you can get some actual guarantees that you're calling this correctly. And so you can say, okay, this will be a center text. Um, and you'll, and you'll know that you're doing that right. Um, and so what, you know, what we're actually doing with this feature is not trying to say, okay, TypeScript is a language on its own, add as many new features that you're lacking in JavaScript. What we set out to say is, this is a really common pattern in JavaScript. How are we going to express that? How are we going to meet people where they are with the patterns that they write today? Um, and in fact, once you have this, a lot of TypeScript users still write APIs that work this way because the tooling enables it to work well. So it's kind of like this virtuous cycle of, of making things feel more JavaScripty as well. Um, and I like that because you know once we once once we started getting into this really interesting uh, domain of union types and literal types, uh, these are string literal types. We have number literal types, and even boolean is a liter a union of true and the literal false, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but then you can create things that know how to operate on objects because in in JavaScript, objects are kind of roughly maps from strings to, to any arbitrary value, right? And so we asked ourselves if there was like a way to express something that would get a property um, out of an object, right? So, you know, you have something like called get um, and you have a T here. So we have generics in, in TypeScript. Um, and, and you wanna be able to say, take like a property name, right? And then you want to be able to return, you know, the property name indexed off of T basically. So what you want to be able to say is like, you want to be able to express an operator like, you know, what is this code actually doing? X of property name. Um, so being able to express this get function is pretty interesting because what you're, what we we were looking into was expressing a, a, a pattern in a library called Ember.js at the time. And we realized this came up in like many different JavaScript libraries of having like a get method and a set method. Um, and so we asked like, how do you express this, this concept of um, this fundamental operation in the language? Um, and so what we, we came up with was some basic operator called key of. And so what this is saying is I will take a T, an object called T, call it obj instead. And I'm gonna take a property name that must be one of the property names known to be on T. So now if I have like a person, if I call it get with a like name, location, then I wanna be able to now get anything that is the name any property of that object, and I can say either name or location on it. So now I'm able to say name. And if I misspell name, then I will get an error on that, which is pretty neat. Um, and you could also similarly write a, um, you could you could write a, um, what is it called again? Uh, sorry, I'm blanking, a set function. But notice right now, like if we, if we hover over this thing, I guess they're both, um, they're both, strings, which is not useful. But if you said like um, age, you could make that a number. Um, so now if we hover over this, it's saying that this thing returns a string or a number. Um, so what you actually want to be able to do is also capture the type of the thing that you're indexing into it. So now if we look, if we introduce a new variable, a type variable called k, you can say extends key of t. If we look at the signature for this thing, it says that it returns a T of K, T indexed in with K. So we have like this type language um, 
of with type operators where you can actually do arithmetic in your types effectively. Um, and so now when you index, if you if you look at the value here, it says it returns a string. Um, and if I turn this into age, it returns a number, as you can see in the signature help. Um, so we, we, we got very expressive with this sort of thing. Um, I'm going to quickly pause to see if there are any questions that are, that are worth. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in with three comments again. Number one, um, note that the get function, we didn't give it a return type. One of the complaints I hear all the time about TypeScript is like, oh, I don't want to write all these type annotations. Type inference is a thing. You need to believe in type inference. And here, it, we, you know, you don't need to write TFK. We know, um, and we can just put it in for you. So uh, to all the haters of the annotations, like <laughs> type inference is powerful, uh, and we do a pretty good job. Uh, yeah. Number two. You can see some of the type inference right here. You didn't have to annotate line as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, keep going, Ben. Number two, align text. Um, you could imagine doing that with overloads. Um, but I, I mean, I find this a lot more ergonomic, a lot more, um, you know, if you're coming from Java, first of all, I don't think in Java you would be able to, uh, you know, define your own literal type or your, your value-based uh, unit type. But here, but you could imagine it being something more general. Um, here, like, it's just in one signature, you don't have to worry about overloads, and it's just a whole lot clearer. We have overloads for other cases where you might need them, um, which Daniel is demonstrating right now, that these, these two implementations of the signature are equivalent, um, but, but I find this more compelling. Um, and then number three, really quickly, um, shortly after I started on the, on the team, um, I spoke to another for, former professor of mine, Rob Simmons, and I said, hey, you know, I'm working on the TypeScript team. Uh, you know, it, it's going great so far. And he said, oh, that's great. You know, with TypeScript, you can really see that it's basically using refinement types under the cover. Um, that I, speaking to the control flow thing um, that we were showing earlier, like um, that's one of the things that that I found really really cool was like you know okay we're not exposing refinement types we're not exposing dependent types in a, like in a way that um, F star would or something like that but you can see it happening you can see we have string or number and then us using the control flow to to apply constraints to that and say, all right, you had a string or number, but you proved via control flow that it was actually at runtime a number. And therefore with that constraint, we can solve and say, okay, in, in lines 23 to 26, you definitely had a number. Um, and so for, for the more theory oriented of you out there, um, I, I think it's, it's really cool how uh, our control flow manifests uh, refinement types in, a, in an ergonomic way. Yeah, we even have some documentation on the website that like specifically shows, we built it into our documentation to show how the type changes over time uh, in something like this. Um, and the funny thing about literal types is before we had union types and, and literal types themselves, we had a special case for, for these patterns. It's kind of funny that you mentioned that then. Um, and then we, we realized like, oh, there's, there's a better way to do this, right? Um, so, I think I think that is that is a pretty pretty cool thing too. Um, the the next thing I want to kind of dive into because like metaprogramming stuff like well here's the thing most of these metaprogramming e patterns don't need to be used by most users, but the whole idea is you give some of the the library authors the ability to write these constructs. And then any user can take advantage of them once they're written. So you don't have to really think about how to write get, but you can always use it as a user and, and it just works for most existing JavaScript libraries. And this is this is where the metaprogramming stuff actually comes into play. Like not, not so much that you are gonna write this every day, but you can you can write JavaScript as you would and never really think about that stuff. So Daniel, there are about 10 minutes left and there are a bunch of questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, if this is uh, a demo that takes a while, may I propose addressing some of the questions instead sure. of the, the example, unless the example is quick. Uh, let's, let's get to some questions for now. 
Um, okay, cool. Yeah, sorry to cut you off there, but I want to make sure that some of the, there's a lot of enthusiasm in the chat. Yeah. People are saying TypeScript is magic to them. Uh, someone yep. pointed out the dependent type when it first came about, Ben, so that's very cool. Um, but there, there are many, many questions. And so um, one of the ones where Hongi and I both got tagged in, so it seems like an urgent question, <laughs> um, is um, what are the hardest patterns um, in JavaScript to actually type check in TypeScript? So like, is, is there a way that you would program to make it easier for type inference or something like that to work? Um, or, you know, would you program TypeScript differently than you program JavaScript? I would also interpret that question as, um, are there any like pain points right now where there are some patterns in, uh, that programmers use in JavaScript that are hard to type in TypeScript? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, with, with any type system, right? Like you are fundamentally limiting the number of programs you can write. So there's always going to be some. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the difficulties that I dealt with for years was some of these APIs that um, are kind of like class factories in JavaScript. And they, they, they kind of like combine many, many niche features into places where you need like specific um, behavior from type inference. And they need to use like the type of the this uh, variable in uh, JavaScript, which is like a special value, um, which changes depending on where you use it, um, and and a whole bunch of these things. And you know, uh, this this was so difficult that to model a library called Vue.js, um, and then similar libraries too. Um, there was a lot of discussion around like how do you provide a better API for TypeScript users, right? Because you know, it, it, this is a very popular technology. I spent many, many, many hours um, with the core contributors trying to like help them out and get something that works well. Um, but there were limitations, right? And 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 the truth is like very, these, these libraries can be kind of hard. So like things that rely on many sophisticated like levels of inference along with along with like implicit things. But um, we try our best to, to model those and, and really say like, we're, you know, what are people trying to write and, and, and help them out? Um, cool, awesome. Yeah, thanks for the answer, Daniel. That's really great. Um, there's another question that I found. Sorry, I've been scrolling through all the questions to pick the, the best one um, uh, or the, the one we have time to answer. But um, someone asked if uh, TypeScript types are ever leveraged for performance optimizations um, in JavaScript. They are not. Uh, the, the, the Closure compiler uh, tried to leverage a little bit of that for being able to rename, rename properties. Um, when we talk about optimization in JavaScript, it's really interesting because you're optimizing typically for binary size or binary size um, rather than speed, like runtime speed, uh, because you're usually concerned with like payload across the wire, downloading, parsing JavaScript, things like that. Um, because we don't have like a fully, um, you know, because you have type holes, basically, you, you do have some risk. So you can't really apply the same sorts of optimizations unless you even limit TypeScript further. Um, our real focus is on productivity and, and safety guarantees, uh, not as much about like optimization. So there are tools where you can leverage TypeScript and the Closure Compiler together, but um, we're, we're not as deeply involved with those. Yeah, and, and I just want to point out that, that we are a little bit uh, more divorced from our runtime than a lot of other languages. Um, you know, it's not like we're compiling to LLVM. It's like you're compiling and then you might be running on Node at runtime or you might be running on V3 or sorry, V8. Um, you might be running on, uh, you know, the Safari like WebKit or something. And um, it's a little scary to optimize ambiguously for those. Whereas all that V8 does is optimizations um, and they are extremely good at it. And, and so uh, we stay out of that space. Well, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's also a question about the relationship um, between TypeScript and WebAssembly or the Envision relationship. And then I'll also throw in another one because uh, Ben's friend Jordan Brown is coming on to talk about Flow, which is Facebook's uh, static type checker for JavaScript in a few weeks. And so I'll, I'll also ask what's, um, what's the relationship with Flow? 
Uh, okay, so LL uh, is not LLVM, WASM, WebAssembly. Yeah, you take uh, WASM, I'll take Flow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with the WebAssembly thing, um, you know, it makes sense to interface between JavaScript and WebAssembly. So the interface makes sense, right? That's that's one of the core things that they've been, you know, the designers have been thinking about. So um, there's definitely a world where we, I, I can see that, you know, TypeScript is able to parse a WASM file and then give you strongly typed API so that you can call a, a WebAssembly module and not have any, you know, you know that you're calling it correctly. You know that you're supposed to pass in a byte array there. Um, be, for the same reason that we can't really optimize um, and because our types are just erasable, that's not our goal. And we're not really thinking about um, emitting TypeScript to WebAssembly. And it's it's really a fun uh, question to ask yourself, like, what does it mean to do that? Like, if you are trying to compile TypeScript to WebAssembly, you say, oh, well, if you needed to compile TypeScript to WebAssembly, you need to compile all the behavior of JavaScript to WebAssembly too. And so now you have to embed all the quirky behaviors of the JavaScript runtime into your the into like the binary that you produce in WebAssembly. And you know, like, do you know the, the meme with a person drawing themselves as like a clown? Like, um, <laughs> or like, you know, putting the makeup for a clown. Like, that's what you're kind of doing because like, hey, you already have a JavaScript runtime on the thing that you're running it on, it's called your browser. It has a thing to have all those quirky behaviors too. Um, so we're not really thinking about that, though there are efforts like assembly script to try to give you that. Um, and so you asked about flow as well, which is, um, which is, which is another type checker for JavaScript. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, Jordan and Ben are, are good friends. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe he can speak to this as well. Uh, we met with the flow folks a couple of years back. Uh, I mean, we knew them before too, but uh, I think we're on good relations too as well. And um, we have a lot of respect for the work that they do and I hope vice versa. But uh, I, I think, you know, that these days um, we, we, have, we have found many co places of common ground of like where it's reasonable to do inference and things like that. Um, for the most part, it seems like Flow is a little bit more interested in accommodating some of the patterns that you'll see within the Facebook internal code base. Um, it's not that flow is not usable by others outside as well, but um, I, I think for from our perspective, it was always not necessarily that we're ignoring Microsoft users internally, but like our, our focus was anybody can use TypeScript. Um, and, and that's kind of like the way that we look is outward facing. And if you're a Microsoft person, you kind of go through the issue tracker by default to try to get help with that sort of thing. Um, so we're trying to make TypeScript very accessible, whereas like Flow has some nice, um, some nice things that they can depend on where they can say, hey, this is the way that you have to code, right? There's no, there, you don't accommodate these jobs or patterns because you just don't write them within within the company this way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I encourage you all to tune in for Jordan uh, when he's on the show, he's a great guy. Um, but through our conversations, I, I think there are two ma main contrasting points. Um, one is, like Daniel's been saying, we're, we're optimized for um, the general case, and they are highly, highly tuned for Facebook's needs as a company. Um, Facebook's JavaScript is at a massive scale that I can't even begin to imagine, um, and they do amazing things with it. Um, really, really incredible things. The second thing is if you look at the development of our, um, of, of our respective tools, um, we've always had this focus on um, developer experience and tooling, like from the very be beginning. And as we've grown, we've, we've focused more and more on soundness and, and patching holes in our type system and going that way. Flow started with soundness, with unification, with a really like watertight Town, uh, watertight type system and moved more and more and more towards tooling. And so, uh, like Daniel mentioned, when we, when we were engaging with, with the Flow team directly a couple of years ago, it's when we were really like starting to hit that crossing point of like, hey, you guys like are really great with such and such nitpicky type system cases. 
And for them, like their completion lists were taking forever and their signature help was taking forever. And there was a lot of cross pollination to uh, cover each other's uh, backs on, on the things that we were respectively not good at. Um, and so it's a great relationship between the two. Um, awesome, cool. So we're just about out of time. Um, Daniel, Ben, do you have final words for the viewers? Hongyi, do you have final words for the viewers? Um, well, I was going to say one quick thing is uh, maybe right after this, you could uh, drop some uh, links to tools that you think uh, TypeScript developers should be checking out that will help them. Oh, yeah, in the Discord, which um, if mm -hmm. Pierce or um, Cubite are still around, please drop a link to the Discord. And hopefully, um, uh, Daniel and Ben have some time, some, some, some point in the next couple of days to, to drop links or, or check it. Um, I would love to. Yeah, but um, I think that's one thing that Hongi and I really hope to cover, but we <laughs> ran out of time because the demos yeah. were so cool. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I also have like many questions about the refinements that underline the types is pretty cool. Um, but um, I guess the, the Discord maybe will be where, where those questions go. Um, but um, yeah, any, any final words to, to leave everybody with? You uh, first, Daniel. OK, so uh, I, I guess, um, you know, if whether or not you are a person who has ever worked with static types before, um, I encourage you to give it a try. TypeScript is a good place to see, hey, if I already know JavaScript, how can I apply some of this stuff little by little to see where, where it helps? Um, you know, we're not, we're not so dogmatic that we, we say types should be used everywhere in every case, um, but you'll find that we try to make it so that there's a kind of on-ramp and you can, you can decide to use them when you need. Um, and what I will say is, as your project grows bigger and more complex, um, it really does help. And we've, we've gotten a lot of partner teams from Google and Airbnb and many other places where adding types cat caught legitimate mistakes. Um, so if you're interested in JavaScript, um, TypeScript's a great place. If you're interested in Python, there's another type checker from uh, Microsoft for Python called PyWrite, and it is also built with productivity in mind too. Um, and you can see some similar stuff happening in the Ruby space too, which is pretty interesting. So it's not just this thing where it was like, hey, Microsoft the evil empire is trying to make this thing and add types and ruin my life. We're trying to just make people <laughs> have to really code, right? So um, give it a shot, check out typeshiplane.org and, um, and follow the typeship Twitter account as well. Um, and you can catch us up on news there. Yeah, and the Discord, we have a TypeScript Discord as well. So yes. come on, hang out with us there. Uh, a couple points that I wanted to hit. Um, Daniel, you're great at covering the sort of product side of things for, for the more theory researchy side of things. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that it took me a little bit to get used to when I joined the team coming from all the uh, heavy type systems research I was doing that Gene mentioned up front um, was uh, that that's not what we do. Um, the, and, and I grew to love this is what we do is we identify real complicated JavaScript, uh, patterns. Um, you know, JavaScript is a crazy, crazy world. Like, I don't need to tell you all that. Um, and what we're doing really is type system innovation driven by real world problems. Um, there are type system features that we've come up with. Happy to talk about this later in the discord. Um, where we just said, you know, this would be cool, but it's not worth the perf hit, and we don't have a meaningful, like, real JavaScript world um, use case for this. Um, all of our innovation is driven by, like, what we're seeing out in the wild. Um, and so um, it's a very different world than academia in that it's, it's not driven by this sort of pursuit of greater type complexity but rather a, a pragmatism. Um, just, just, I mean, maybe I'm showing my particular academic heritage here, um, but, but it, it, it's really cool to, to have this um, DX focus um, and be able to bring these concepts from academia, these refinement types, these um, you know, type level algebra things uh, and make them real. And that's what I love. 
Cool. No, yeah. Thank, thank you both, Daniel and Ben. I think this is a great note to end on. I agree that developer experience is is the hard part um, yeah. that, that we need to solve in order to get adoption of some of these ideas. And so I'm sure a lot of people will have a lot of questions in the Discord. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming. These questions were great. Uh, the comments were great. There are some really uh, funny comments. I'm Daniel and Ben. You guys should go back through the comments after. Yeah, this. I'm really excited to look. There, yeah, there are some great quotes um, <laughs> that you might yeah. want to use um, in your in your various materials. Um, but um, but yeah, thank you everyone. And so coming up, as I hinted, on April 30th, we have uh, Jordan Brown, who is Ben's friend. In fact, that's how I know Jordan. Jordan also. Also was an undergrad who worked with me. So Jordan and I skipped around campus doing research together. Um, but now Jordan works on uh, the flow type checker. And so he'll be coming on April 30th. Uh, we're counting back. So April 23rd, we have uh, Dr. Neha Rungta from the Amazon AWS Selkova team. So Neha will be talking about how we use uh, the SMT solving to make IAM permissions better. It's going to be really interesting. And then next Friday, we have a break. Everyone can uh, use that time to try TypeScript. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, thank um, you both for the opportunity. This has been really, really great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Thanks no, for coming. Thank this you. was super fun and enlightening. And um, oh, also someone posted a blog post um, during about how TypeScript is uh, level one gradually typed. It was very interesting. Ah, cool. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. abusing the terminology. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. no. Just, yeah, I, I'm also very confused about this because I feel like it's, uh, apparently there are three levels. But well, for anyone who was also confused, TypeScript is level one. Some things are level like three. It's like when you get to level <laughs> three, you special room. Yeah. Hey, at yeah. least there's a taxonomy. Now you can't right. be like, oh, so this is strongly typed. What does that mean? Yeah, right. it's level level five typing. Yeah. yeah. So right. if anyone ever asked you, you can say, according to Jeremy Seek, who invents who coined the term gradual typing, it's level one gradual typed. Awesome. Gotcha. Cool. Um, all right. Well, goodbye everyone. See you in the Discord.